uh, let's go ahead and begin. Um, thank you all for taking the time out and joining this webinar. My name is Riddhi Raparia and I'm currently a first year fellow with the uh, University of North Carolina and GSK. Um, I'll be the host for this webinar on next steps. So before we get started, I just wanted to talk about the objectives of the webinar. So the purpose of the webinar is to really just identify where and when fellows should start looking for full-time employment opportunities, describe important company qualities to look out for when seeking industry positions, provide valuable tips on managing application submissions, the interview process, and advice on handling job offers, and also explore ways to tackle the challenges that are involved in transitioning from being a fellow to becoming a full-time employee. Now, we do have a list of preset questions for our speakers to answer, but please feel free to submit questions in the Q&A section throughout the webinar. These questions will be answered at the end. Um, it should, there should be a Q&A box on your screen where you could go ahead and type those in. And before we begin the Q&A portion, I would like the speakers to just quickly introduce themselves. Hi, um, can I just check that you can hear me okay? Yes, we can. So my name is Christina. I uh, finished a fellowship at uh, GSK through the UNC GSK fellowship program in uh, just the end of May, started full time at GSK in June. And I uh, graduated from Rutgers Pharmacy, um, as did actually Matt and Dan. So uh, we were classmates back in the day. And currently I'm a mm -hmm. manager in global regulatory affairs in the oncology therapeutic group. Hey everyone, uh, this is Matt Bermudez. Um, similar to Christina, you know, I did my PharmD uh, Rutgers 0 to 6 uh, straight out of high school. Um, during the fellowship program, which I did with uh, the Rutgers Pharmaceutical Program, uh, I started an MBA, uh, hopefully finishing that up this year. Uh, it's for my fellowship, I did a, a fellowship in regulatory advertising promotion and healthcare compliance uh, with J&J. &J. I finished that up in 2019. Uh, and then recently, uh, in, around May, uh, I transitioned to a full-time role as associate manager in regulatory ad promo um, in the immunology space for Regeneron. Hey, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Daniel. Um, I also graduated from Rutgers uh, from the class of 2017. Um, went to the same school and class uh, with Matt and Christina. Um, I actually did a oncology brand marketing fellowship, um, which is actually in partnership with uh, IPHO, which I completed at the at May of last year. Um, now um, I am the senior specialist of market research and analytics for oncology uh, at Merck. All right, thank you so much for the introductions. Um, so now let's just go ahead and begin the Q&A portion. So this is really um, going to be an informal type discussion where all the speakers will answer the questions that we have set. So the first question, uh, where and when do you start the job search? Hi, so this is Christina. So I started my job search toward the end of January of the year I was finishing up fellowship. And really, you can kind of look anywhere. I googled positions and regulatory, um, as simple as that sounds, you'll find a lot just looking that way. LinkedIn tends to also have a lot of opportunities posted as well as recruiters reaching out to you when they kind of know that you're looking. And I think there's actually a toggle you can switch in LinkedIn that shows that you're actively looking. So that's another tip that you can do. Um, and they have like a job section where you can look at postings there as well. And you can also check sites like Indeed and Monster and all of those recruiting sites and you know, search for listings that way. I know, um, plug for IPHO, I know IPHO Cho has a job board as well. So that's another option. Um, so there's plenty of resources you can use really. Yeah, so um, this is Matt. So similar to Christina, I think around the January timeframe, I think post mid-year, I might have been updating my CV on the flight. Uh, no shame. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of great resources. And I think, you know, the, the goal of your fellowship probably is that you would stay with your partner company, uh, most likely if there's an opportunity. So I think you know, figuring out if there's an opportunity to stay would be your first step, um, as well as maybe you're looking for a transition to another role. Uh, so understanding what opportunities exist at your partner company. Uh, but at the same time, Christina listed a lot of great resources that I used. Um, I, I think I found Indeed in particular to be really good because, 
you know, sometimes, like Christina said, you'll search regulatory and then you might get things that aren't really uh, pharmaceutical or health sciences. So I think it actually gives you some filtering options um, where you can make it, you know, pharma, life sciences, and really kind of narrow the search, you know, filter by, you know, you have two years of the fellowship experience, so probably a manager level um, helps narrow things down uh, to make things easier for you. Hey everyone. Um, so just to add on to that, I think what what's going to be pretty important is um, you know think about the keywords that you would search for. So um, you know it's it's important that maybe you can ask for advice from this from your parent companies. Uh, so you know for example for marketing, you know you would think about um, things that has to do with um, non promotional channels or things to do with um, sales aids or strategy or things of that nature. Um, and if you're looking for specific things for your role, um, you know, you want to do things like marketing manager or brand manager or, um, you know, product manager. Um, sometimes there's, there could be some, you know, different names out there. And, you know, sometimes the way that LinkedIn and Indeed work is um, it really just depends on how you search. Um, but, you know, it's, it's think about how you can also leverage those platforms for their alerts um, or if you have um, people in your network, uh, sometimes they would share jobs and um, sometimes what you can do is, um, you know, don't be afraid to reach out to people. Um, you know, this is probably the time um, that you can start, you know, looking around and asking as well, like, hey, my fellowship is coming up soon. This is what I'm interested in. Um, it's good to just have those ongoing conversations um, because sometimes you never know, you could land a job that wasn't even posted online um, or on a, um, a company's website, it's something that you just got just from word of mouth. So there's multiple ways you can do it. Um, definitely do an online share, uh, an online search, keep yourself organized. Um, you know, the way I did is that you had a spreadsheet, you keep track of everything, but also make sure you ask around and don't only ask within your company. Um, it's important that you try to your best to leverage whatever, whatever relationships you have with other companies. Um, and, you know, people understand as a fellow coming up towards the close towards the end, um, you know, you want to make sure you get the, the next best role possible for yourself. All right. Uh, thank you for answering the question. Um, just, just moving on to the next one. Um, what types of company qualities do you think a fellow should look out for when seeking opportunities post fellowship? Sure. So um, this is Christina again. So uh, for me personally, I thought culture was a biggie. Um, I, I really wanted to make sure I found a place that had an open and approachable and collaborative culture, um, especially, you know, coming from GSK and now staying at GSK. That's definitely something I saw there and I wanted to make sure wherever I went had that same kind of culture. And I definitely wanted to make sure that there were opportunities for learning and development. So of course, when you're a fellow, you're in that role where you're constantly like a sponge trying to absorb and learn. But I wanted to get a little bit of that still post fellowship as well and try to get different opportunities to be exposed to as well. So that was a big one. Um, for me as well, I wanted to have a global role. So looking for roles and companies that have more of a global influence, um, if that interests you and therapeutic area as well. Um, so for instance, for me personally, I was interested in companies that had a heavy influence in oncology. So um, looking for things like that as well, what kind of um, pipeline they have. And if the pipeline is promising as well, that could also be some added job security. So that's definitely something to keep in mind because um, at the end of the day, you know, it's a post fellowship job is you want to think of it as more of a permanent role. So you want something that has some level of job security. And of course, the location has to work for you. So just keep all those things in mind when you're looking at a company. Yeah. Hey, everyone. So it's Matt. Um, a lot of great points there. I, I tend to agree. I think, you know, you're almost, I, I like to think of it like you're a free agent now, almost, you know, you could stick with your partner company, but there's uh, a lot out there that you can kind of explore and maybe find a better fit. Maybe you didn't like your fellowship, but didn't find the right fit. And now, you know, uh, you know, what kind of company suits you best and also what you've done. Um, but what you need to do to kind of get you where you want to be in your career. So I think the first thing would really be uh, growth opportunities. You know, what company is going to give you experiences that maybe you didn't get to take part in in your fellowship, um, but there's something that you could do there that's going to get you to where you want to be. 
Um, and then I think also some factors about the company and personal things that, you know, you took into account when you were also looking at fellowship programs, you know, location wise, where do you want to be? Do you want to travel? Um, company size, I think is a big one too. You know, are you looking for a giant company where maybe it's a, um, you know, you get to see and do a lot and maybe travel more, or are you interested in something that's more of a startup, small team, um, probably get your hands maybe a little bit more dirty than something else. Uh, U.S. versus global was a good one that Christina brought up, uh, as well as therapeutic area. So do you want to be in a space that's um, maybe evolving more or, or something that's, um, you know, a little bit more competitive maybe? Uh, and I guess the last thing is, you know, you're the business savvy type, even just taking a look at company stocks, taking a look at their pipeline uh, and trying to, you know, figure out where the market is headed, I think is something that's going to uh, lend itself to your experience. Yeah, and, and so this is Daniel. Just to add on to what Christina and Matt have said, um, you know, these are all really good points about the company itself when you want to ask about, you know, how do, how does the, what are the company's values? Um, you know, what are the opportunities in terms of doing, you know, purely U.S. work versus global work, um, you know, paying attention to the pipeline, the therapeutic area, um, you know, there's opportunities that, you know, you can get um, some level of experience that helps you to get promoted or maybe just to get to your next job. Um, I think that was a big one for me. Do I have the ability to perhaps do a special project here and there where if I wanted to move over to another function, you know, that's something that I can talk about later on um, and get other skill sets. Um, I, think, I think the one thing I, I wanted to make sure I mentioned was just making sure that you ask about um, the people and how specifically also your hiring manager and your team um, would work with you and the kinds of things that they would offer for you. Um, that was a big one when I was um, interviewing actually was, you know, who's, who's, what kind of hiring manager is this? How would they act as my boss? Um, are they the type of person that would be supportive um, in, in terms of, you know, giving myself independence and, and make, giving myself autonomy in my work, or are they going to be the type of people that want to know every, absolutely everything that I'm doing? Um, and, you know, those type of factors really, um, you know, you have to understand just your working style and what kind of relationship you, you want to have with your manager, um, as well as the team. Are, is there, are they the type where, you know, you have a very specific role and they're going to be depending on you for certain things, or is it going to be a lot more collaborative and depending on the types of projects you're doing? Um, digging into those type of things really does make an impact about the kind of job you're going into as well. Not only, um, and also pretty telling about the company culture and how they interact with each other and how teams interact with each other and, and, uh, and such. All right, uh, so just a follow-up question on that. Um, what are some good questions to ask a company when interviewing to really get a better understanding of the opportunities that may, they may be presented with if given the job? Hi, so Christina again. I think kind of going back to a lot of the points that were raised with the last question, um, really try to probe the interviewer for what you'd actually be doing on the job. Um, some ways to do that are asking, you know, what kind of projects or experiences would I be able to do if, um, if I were to um, start this position? So things like that. Um, and if you have specific examples in mind of things that you actually do want to work on, whether it's, you know, for instance, regulatory, whether it's a type of submission or a type of application, um, maybe it's specific type of product or therapeutic area. Um, some things, of course, are confidential and they won't be able to share certain details, but they might have a vague idea of what they're actually hiring the candidate for. So just um, try to try to get a sense of that. Um, kind of going back again to the other question, I think um, asking them about what the company culture and dynamic is like is important. Um, maybe what the um, hiring manager's uh, management style is, kind of like what Dan said, you know, you kind of want to get a sense of whether they are going to be letting you be autonomous or micromanaging you. So I think there's certain ways that you can frame certain questions to get the answers um, that you're trying to find. So just keep those things in mind. Yeah, that's a lot of good ones. I was thinking along the same lines of, you know, what projects are ongoing, you know, what maybe the group is, you know, they're obviously looking for a headcount if you're interviewing with them. So there must be some things that they can't handle right now. So I guess getting an idea of why they need this headcount and you know what you're gonna bring uh, to the group is important. 
Uh, and on top of that, maybe a little bit long, more long term, um, just to speak to my experience, I joined a really small team um, that really needed people because the workload was so high. But I also want to think about kind of the vision of the group, you know, where do you see our group being in five years, for example, um, and then how do you kind of fit into that picture? So um, just asking the hiring manager, you know, where do you see the vision of this group uh, in the coming years? Uh, another good one I thought of, you know, maybe there are people been have been in that group before. Where are they now? You know, did they jump ship? Because that might be a telltale sign of uh, maybe the group um, and how things are run. Or, you know, did they advance and then moved on to something even more interesting and maybe something that you're interested in? Um, all those kinds of things can give you an idea of how you're going to develop in that role. Yeah, all uh, all great points raised. I. I think also what's what's pretty important to ask is, um, you know, ask about um, just the day to day stuff from the people that you talk to. Um, I mean, more often than not, um, at least when I was interviewing last year, um, you know, I, I, I interviewed with at least maybe five or six people within a day and you have the opportunity to really ask either very similar questions about, you know, uh, the kinds of work people do in the in the functional area, um, you know, how do they collaborate as a team, um, you know, how, what's the opportunity where you get to work with uh, either upper management um, or have the ability to collaborate um, with other team members, um, you know, those type of things, you know, were really important to me to ask. Um, and, and to be very honest, um, I think what What's, what's a, kind of a little bit of a psychological trick you can do is um, if you ask questions that, you know, open up the person to talk about themselves a little bit more, um, you know, they talk about a particular project they did or if they have a, a certain thought or opinion about maybe some sort of topic in the industry that relates to your function. Um, so, for example, I was I interviewed mostly for marketing and market research and commercial roles. And, you know, we talk about, you know, issues that come across with um, having seven oncology products in the marketplace and how do you make sure that you promote effectively and have your brand really be uh, something that's top of mind for, um, for physicians and patients. And, um, you know, those type of topics are of interest and always on people's minds. And, you know, having that kind of, um, you know, ability to, com to conversate as well um, with those type of questions, you know, really can speak volumes about who you are as a person and it adds a lot more impression as well. All right. Um, so in terms of your parent company, how transparent should you be on which companies you're applying to in addition to your host company? And what do you say when you have interviews to your host company? Hi again, it's Christina. So um, in terms of how transparent on which specific companies, um, I, I don't think that necessarily your managers and people that you work with will necessarily be asking which company are you interviewing with and if they do kind of go to that extent you can always say you know you'd rather not share which company but you know if you do for instance have to travel you could just say you know you have to travel um, to be honest I've also spoken with people who have just said you know I, I, I'm sorry I just need a, a personal day and really I mean unless your manager is the kind to micromanage you they shouldn't be like kind of prying to find out why. So you might not even necessarily be in a situation where you have to admit that you're traveling for an interview until you get to the point where, you know, you're negotiating and things like that. And they already know that you have a competing offer or something like that. So I think there's a lot of different ways to handle it. It kind of depends on personal preference. If you want to be open and honest that you're interviewing with other companies and you do want to share what companies they are, you can definitely feel free to do that. So it kind of just depends on the level of information you want to share and what you're comfortable with. Um, but I, I think that's probably what I would do in that situation. Yeah. Yeah. So, so for me, I think transparency was huge and I know um, the three of us kind of were in different situations. I ended up leaving uh, my partner company for my fellowship program. Um, but I think it also comes down uh, to what you want to be transparent about. So I think in terms of being upfront and telling them, you know, I really appreciate the experience that, this program, but at the same time, you know, I'm interested in uh, understanding other opportunities that are out there is important. And, you know, nine times out of 10, I don't know anyone's specific situation, but, you know, you were their fellow because they wanted to develop you. They have a uh, vested interest in you and your development, whether you stay or not. So 
So I think uh, that kind of transparency just shows your professionalism uh, ending the fellowship and going forward into a new role. Um, but in terms of similar to what Christina said, I think, you know, sharing things like the specific company or what roles, um, that's probably a little bit too much. And I don't think it would really be asked of you or really necessary to share. Um, but, you know, the, the, when the situation comes up that you need to go on an interview, I don't think it's really necessary to, you know, just take a personal day. You don't really have to tell them wh what it really is for. Um, I guess the caveat being you might be in a situation where uh, you do have an offer on the table with your partner company, um, in which case, you you know, they kind of need to have an answer and you get into timelines. Um, but in that case, you know, I think erring on the side of transparency, you know, in the scenario of you have a, jo a job offer, but you want to go on this interview, you know, just being upfront and telling them that, you know, you're going to go on this interview, you'd like the time to have them make, uh, have the ability to make that decision. Um, it's something that either company will probably uh, be really appreciative of. Yeah, so just to, um, I guess, wrap this up, I, I agree with a lot of what Christina and Matt have said. Um, you know, I was, I was pretty transparent in terms of, you know, yeah, I'm looking for a role. Um, I think for me, so yeah, I actually, so I left my, my uh, fellowship company and uh, moved on to another one. And um, I think it really just also depends on the relationship you have with your preceptor. Um, and I think it, it would um, really benefit you if you just didn't go into too many details about what specific companies and what specific roles and things like that. But um, I think as part of your fellowship, um, it's all about, you know, you getting the next role, rather than whether or not you're going to stay at the parent company or not. And I think more often than not, from what I understand, talking to other people too, is that almost all preceptors get that at this point, um, you know, especially for a lot of managers um, that have experience with developing fellows, you know, they know that it's just business at the end of the day too. And you, they don't always get to keep you. If they can, that's great. And if it's a, it's a role that, that really um, is a good fit for you, then, then that's great that, you know, you don't have to go through the, the struggle of trying to onboard with a new company when you start. But um, I think what, what's really important is that, you know, you, essentially put at the forefront that this is where I want to be, you know, in the next like 10 years or so, you know, what do you aspire to be and how are you going to get there? And I think if you leave the conversation about these are the type of skill sets I want to gain, and um, this is the kind of experience I want to get, you know, um, I think it's just important that you, keep, you always keep that in mind and keep that at the forefront of your conversations, especially during this time um, when you're talking to your preceptors and, um, you know, hopefully more than not, they can help you out too. All right. Um, and this is more about the actual interview itself, but what are some things you should do or not do when you're interviewing at your sponsor company? Hi. Uh, so definitely um, something that I think a lot of people might not know going into an interview with their sponsor company is that you should still definitely take it just as seriously as you would take an interview externally. Um, you don't want to, you know, whoever you're interviewing with to think that you feel almost too comfortable to the point that, you know, you're not taking it seriously and you feel like it's kind of like you already have the job before you really, you know, even actually completed the interview process because that can really come off the wrong way. So definitely take it just as seriously, you know, like, um, for instance, um, I, I wore, you know, a full suit just as you would with any other interview and still, you know, shook whoever was interviewing um, me, they shook their hand and it could be people who I speak to on a daily basis for projects, but I still like when it comes time to the interview, it was like a switch was on and off. Like I'm still in interview mode, taking it very seriously. So just keep that in mind and um, definitely things to, you know, to not do um, if you're interviewing your sponsor company would be kind of like being a little bit too casual or uh, I don't know making kind of jokes or about like you know other companies obviously I think that kind of goes without saying but just the kind of obvious do's and don'ts in some regard but um, I think yeah my biggest thing would just be make sure to still take it just as seriously as you would as like an on-site at an external company. Yeah, I couldn't agree with that more. And I was, I was thinking along the same lines. Um, I think formality should be the default, you know, kind of to Christina's point, go in like it's an interview with people you never met, even though 
you know, they might have been uh, your sponsor at the, at the partner company. They might have been your manager. Um, and then, you know, you just kind of show that professionalism of you're serious about the job. You don't think it's in the bag, uh, even though maybe you were even groomed for that specific position and you, you have certain assumptions. Just really shows um, that you want it and that, um, you know, you kind of came prepared for everything. Uh, in terms of do, I would say, um, just in addition to Christina, to uh, leverage your connections at the partner company. So um, even if, you know, there's a, a clear job or role that you know about, um, just talking to people and understanding that, you know, they know you're going for a role. Um, and even if maybe that role doesn't work out, there's something else that kind of be retrofitted uh, to what you're looking for. I, I've heard, you know, dozens of cases where, you know, maybe they were looking for an associate director or director role, but, you know, the fellow was kind of wrapping up and it made sense for them to uh, hire someone maybe at a lower level um, in the meantime, because they really needed a person, um, which happened to be uh, similar to the case where I ended up at my company now. Um, you know, again, just leveraging those connections, making sure that um, everyone knows that you're really serious about the position at the partner company, and you never know what could end up happening, even if uh, there's not an open role. Yeah, I, I, I agree with, with what both uh, Matt and Christina have said. Um, I think a couple things you really should do is, um, you know, make it very clear um, with other people that you know at the company of, you know, what you're interested in, what you're open towards. Um, and, you know, you never know what kinds of roles are really around. Um, you know, like Matt said, they there, there. More often than not, there has some, been some some positions that would lower down just because, you know, if you know the product well, you know the functional area well, you know the people well, um, you know, if there's very particular projects, especially that they see long term, that um, you know that you would be a good fit for, then that's something that you can definitely talk through and make the case. Um, you know, some of the don'ts um, obviously is um, don't try to present yourself. Um, like you know everything, um, don't ever try to act like um, you know you have the ability to um, uh, take take every, anything for granted at the company um, in terms of you know you know the people around um, you know you know say if you have a good relationship with one of the leadership team members and you know you think just because of that it's it's they're going to hire you um, at the end of the day they want to make sure they also have a good fit for the role and. Um, you know, it, it, that's okay if it's not you. Um, that just means that there's there's other things out there for yourself. Um, so um, don't get overly confident. Um, I think it's a good advantage that if you um, really understand the ins and outs of your company and you can portray that well, but it has to be in a, in a um, both a confident but a very professional way as you would any other candidate. Um, and in terms of offers, so what do you do if you're given an early offer by another company? So I, I was not personally in this uh, specific situation. Um, for me, it was kind of um, the, other, the other way around in some sense where I already knew where, that I was going to be starting internally um, before I got to the on-site step of interviews. Um, so I actually I essentially canceled my on-sites because I had to give a response and I knew I wanted to stay on. So I wasn't personally in this situation, um, but that's what I would do if it was, you know, the other way around where if you know that that company is your top choice, regardless of whether it's internal or external, that's always an option depending on how the timelines work out. But I think ideally if the timelines align in a way that you have a competing offer um, around the same time that you're kind of wrapping up your on sites with another company, whether it's on internal or external um, and, or potentially even have you know, two offers on the table, you can really leverage that to your advantage and you can actually negotiate for a higher pay um, at whichever company is your top choice. So it's definitely good to, um, you know, apply and cast a wide net and apply externally as well, even if you do want to stay on internally. Um, of course, for one thing, just to see what other opportunities are out there for your own benefit, but also at the end of the day, knowing that you can always use that to negotiate a better salary. And I've, I've seen that happen with a few folks. So um, I know it's a little bit intimidating um, to go through that process, but um, just, just know that, you know, usually HR has like a set kind of number in mind and a set range and they can go 
um, kind of above and below that. So, um, you know, it's never kind of never really hurts to ask. Yeah, so I was in a very similar position, uh, unlike Christina. So um, I, I think going back to the idea of transparency, right? Um, you've spent two years or a year at this company. This is kind of where you began your career, where you have a lot of your connections. Um, the worst thing would be to leave on bad terms. Um, so I think first, you know, just being really clear that you have an offer from another company, uh, depending on if you're interviewing at your partner company or not, just so that they have an understanding that you probably have a deadline to meet and uh, to make your decision for that other company. Um, and I guess in the scenario of uh, having both, you know, you really want to be um, ultra transparent in the decision you're making, um, you know, depending on how comfortable you are with people, why you're making it and um, just really leaving on the best possible terms, because of course you never know what's happening in the future. Uh, you might go, uh, get some years of experience at this other company, come back, um, and, you know, maybe you advance even faster because your company values outside experience. So you really never know uh, what the scenario is going to be like. But I think if you get that early offer, um, you know, just don't leave early and unexpectedly. Really make sure that you and your sponsors have an understanding of uh, when is an okay time before your two years or year or up to leave the fellowship so that way when uh, the dust kind of settles and you're in your full-time position um, you know everyone had a good understanding of how things were going to play out and you know any projects or anything you had going uh, were appropriately transitioned and you kind of put a plan into place um, i think that's on top of this all that's probably another good tip is that if you do end up leaving um, there's probably another fellow coming after you um, and you want to kind of set them up for success as well. So um, anything that you can do uh, to maybe fill a drive with notes and, um, you know, things that you learned and maybe, you know, some fellowships have a manual kind of updating that um, really goes a long way to say, you know, I put in my two years, my one year here and did all I could for the program. I'm moving on, but, um, you know, I hope we can stay in touch in the future and uh, for any other opportunities that might be coming along. Yeah, I, I I think for me, um, you know, I I had a couple offers um, before um, anything my my company that I was at would would offer anything. So, um, but again, I think that that's be, that's because um, it's important that you again start early and have those conversations about your next step. And um, when it gets to this point where you do have an offer an offer from other company and you're very excited, it's very exciting. I mean, you have you. It's it, it's most likely a really good role, and you, um, you know, it's that you're at this point where you know you can't believe that you're just gonna get a full time job, um, and now you're going through this process of negotiating with HR and understanding what's the terms of the role and all this other stuff that comes with your package, um, and so I think what's really important is that um, you know you have to you have to give an answer in a very timely manner um, because what's also happening is that um, you know. They also have uh, potential other candidates that they want to make an offer if you're not going to be the one taking it. And um, there's, a, there's a crunch timeline. Sometimes they only give you maybe two, three days at most. And, you know, if, if, you, if timing comes out okay and you have, a, you have a couple offers and then you can go through the, the negotiation process, you know, then you can extend that a little bit. But, um, you know, it's, it's pretty important that, um, you know, you, you think about just the timing of, when you want to leave the fellowship um, and also um, think about the timing of um, it's exactly to Matt's and Christina's point um, about transitioning and all that kind of stuff um, because you know going to another company um, it happens all the time in our industry you know people jump around and it's it's not exactly you trying to break loyal, loyalty but you know to Matt's point you know you take the steps to make sure um, you know, you transition everything really well. Um, you make sure all the, the projects are in a good place the best you can. Um, you know, you, you have all these different um, plans in place um, where it's, it's very clear to your team and especially your preceptor. Um, and, you know, those type of, that type of proactivity is very important um, just to show that, um, you know, you had a good relationship with the parent company and, and uh, you're willing to make sure you're keeping that relationship going. 
All right. And any general advice to prepare for interview season? Sure. So I think it's honestly, you know, for, you know, we have a lot of fellows on the line. So it's very similar to what you had to go through for mid-year in some ways. I mean, it's all when it comes down to it, it's speaking to your experiences that you've had during your fellowship and the same way that you would speak to maybe, you know, your leadership through professional experiences at mid-year. So the same, you know, star method <laughs> that you would use when you're preparing for mid-year, it's not really all that different in that way. Just um, in the, I guess the main difference would be that you're really focusing entirely on your fellowship experience because that's probably the most applicable to the role you're interviewing for. So obviously focus on that for all of your questions. Um, I think, um, a key point is um, whether, you know, you're interviewing externally or even internally, don't assume that, you know, the interview, interviewer knows exactly what you worked on. So make sure to speak in detail about the type of work that you've done and how that's um, really contributed to the program and um, to whatever you were working on and how you can translate that to whatever role you're interviewing for, whether it's within the same department or something different. I think it's all about how you link the two together. So, um, you know, and try not to stress out too much. It's at the end of the day, it's just really just talking about yourself and your experiences. So good luck. <laughs> yeah, I was actually surprised. Christina brings up a good point. You know, if you've been through mid-year, it's almost like riding a bike, you know, you, you kind of jump right back into quote unquote interview season. Um, you know, and it's actually, in my experience, way less stressful than mid-year, right? You, you've had some experience on your belt, you have real things that you can talk to. Um, and now you're in, it's almost like this mix of stress, but also excitement, right? Because you're gonna have your first full-time role, something that you've been working towards for a while now. Um, so I guess going with that mentality, uh, something that I did uh, mostly throughout the fellowship was just kind of logging, um, you know, major accomplishments and things that I knew that I would want to speak to on an interview. And if that's something that you haven't done throughout the fellowship, it's obviously not a big deal because you remember those major milestones. Um, so just kind of retroactively jotting those things down um, and even applying the STAR method, like Christina mentioned, you know, if you had this certain experience that you think is really good or the best thing you did in your whole fellowship, you know, what's your story around that? How did you contribute? Um, and what's really going to make that come across to an interviewer as something impressive and something that they can, uh, you know, they're willing to take you on their team? Yeah, I think uh, there's just one word I'll, I'll I, I think just wraps it up the best for me. Practice. Practice interviewing. Practice with yourself, practice with somebody, practice um, with whoever you trust to give you good advice. Um, you need to practice interviewing. Um, and, and you know, you're at a different place than you were one or two years prior. Um, you know, now you have some, you know, very concrete um, experiences and accomplishments, um, and you have a lot of outcomes you can talk about, you, you have metrics, um, you know, you accomplished X, Y, Z that impacted, you know, ABC, whatever it is, um, you know, you should definitely take the time to jot that down. Um, you know, what a lot of what uh, of Matt was saying, if you weren't doing that with, um, you know, throughout your fellowship and keeping track of those things, it's a good time to just, you know, jot those things down and don't rush it. Um, you know, try your best to just give yourself the time to practice and, and to think it out. Um, you know, it's important that you still do things like look up, you know, the top types of um, questions that get asked in interviews. Um, you can definitely ask other people uh, at your company, like, hey, they, they, they know that you're interviewing. They know that you're getting to this step. And, you know, especially with someone that you have a close tie with, they can definitely give you that advice about, hey, you know, these are the common types of behavioral questions that a manager in regulatory or manager in marketing or manager in medical or whatever would get asked. Um, you know, you should talk about these specific types of skill sets if you have them. Um, and you also want to think about, you know, different types of behavioral type questions, situational type questions, um, you know, and be prepared to talk about yourself a lot and um, not come off as too braggy, but, you know, you, you basically are coming across as, you know, here's what I have to offer. These are what differentiates, differentiates me across um, against other candidates you might talk to. This is who I am as a person, all those type of things. Um, and make sure that you come prepared with good questions. Um, you know, don't always rely on the general things. Um, sometimes it's really important that maybe you 
um, think about how you pay close attention to someone as they're talking and they talk about themselves because um, you know that's a very good skill to have where you have a follow-up question and you have a good conversation with someone rather than it being like a straight on interview. Um, so those type of things, you know, just practice talking about yourself and you know do have some some practice sessions with people um, if you have that opportunity. Um, write out your answers, um, you know, get your obviously your resume in order, all those type of things. Um, and you know, you, 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 it's a good way to reflect because then that makes you really realize like, wow, I actually do have a lot to talk about. For those of you who maybe haven't started yet preparing, um, believe me, it was pretty eye-opening when um, I went through this exercise a couple times and um, it actually was pretty eye-opening how much I could talk about and you can just tailor it depending on the company and the role and what exactly um, would they be looking for. All right, thank you. And if in the same company after the fellowship, what are some ways of easing the transition? Hi, so I think um, for me, uh, having stayed on at the same company, definitely um, the transition was pretty smooth because it was pretty much like, with the exception of one week vacation in between, I kind of like came out one day as a fellow and came in the other day as a full-time employee and felt no different sat in the same seat <laughs> but in some ways it was very different um you know i think when you're a full-time employee you'll probably get a little bit more responsibility on projects so you'll definitely feel a difference um i think in terms of easing the transition just know that similar to fellowship you can always reach out to whoever is um, in your um, leadership line or in your team and um, ask for help and guidance. So you're never really um, alone, even though you might have a little bit more independence on your projects. Um, I think um, one big thing if you're staying within the same company is, although they'll probably send out, you know, maybe some kind of announcement saying that you're no longer a fellow and that you're, you know, a full time um, some people might still kind of think that you're a fellow for a little while afterwards. So I think just kind of having um, some sort of transition. Um, I remember um, last year at the, uh, there was, IPHO had some kind of round table event. There were a few people um, who came and spoke about their experiences is very similar to this. Um, and I remember someone saying she even like sat in a different seat, like to kind of distinguish her um, fellowship ending and her full-time role beginning. I don't know if you necessarily have to go to that extent, but that's, you know, there's really a lot of creative ways you can go about it. Um, I, I know one thing I did was um, I had transitioned kind of one of my uh, more fellow type activities um, that was more of like, um, like a, I guess, a secretariat type of role, which is really great experience for um, a fellow to get. It's really good, you know, project management type of experience. But I, I felt like after, you know, two years, I really kind of had a solid grasp on it and I was ready to move on to um, different activities that were consuming more of my time at that point. So I think transitioning that to your, um, whoever your current fellows are, it would be a good experience for them and also kind of separates, creates that separation of, okay, I'm no longer a fellow. I'm not doing, you know, the fellow activities that would normally be expected of a fellow. I'm now focused on solely this project work or any maybe above project initiatives that I, that I would have as a full-time employee. But um, I think that would kind of help um, provide that sort of transition and separation as well from your previous role. Yeah, interesting. So I, I guess I don't have much to contribute to this one. Uh, I guess from you know my experience, um, something that my manager actually did uh, when I when I started at my new company was really not even label my past experience. Rather than you know calling it a fellowship, it was two years of J and J. Um, and maybe to Christina's point about announcements and you know being the fellow to being a full time employee, uh, maybe that's how it's kind of positioned. You know, you, because it's it's factual. It's, you had these two years of experience. It doesn't need to be, you know, you did, um, you know, some of those roles that might be expected of a fellow. It's you got those two years of experience. Uh, you know, now you're a full-time employee. People should look at you like you are. So I guess that's my two cents. Yeah. I, um, coming from my personal experience, um, you know, I, I didn't stay at my company, um, but I, I know the two previous fellows but before me did stay at my company. And um, I think for them, um, you know, the announcement is always was really good, but I know they made the effort to, you know, have personal conversations with maybe people they worked for, um, as well as, um, you know, any other 
types of uh, managers or anyone else at that level, um, associate directors, all those type of people, um, and just have one-on-ones with them and just talk through like, hey, you know, now I'm a full-time employee. This is actually going to be my role. These are the products I'm working on in the next few months. Um, you know, this is my this is my place in the team. This is what I want to do. And you, if you come from a place and you talk like you're a full employee, and um, you know, to Christina's point, you're no longer talking about these other things you had to do with your fellowship, um, like any kind of committees or things like that, which were great and they were important. But now that you are, you know, 100% of your time is with the company itself and what you do with the company, um, you know, as long as you come across and start talking that way, then it takes a little bit of time. I mean, I think for them, um, you know, they got called a fellow maybe once or twice before, um, but it, 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 took, it took a little bit of time, you know, it's be patient. Um, you know, you have to just remember that um, a lot of the team members you're working for, it's, it was a habit that they had and that's how they knew you before. But once they start to see like the kinds of things you do as a manager or whatever your um, title is, um, you know, then they start to see you as something else. So it just takes time and just be patient, patient for it. All right, thank you. And you guys have sort of alluded, oh, sorry, you guys have sort of alluded to this before, but um, what type of projects do you think a fellow should try to be involved in when they start the new role? So I think um, you'll have a little bit probably more, you know, independence and responsibility. I think trying to have a project where you're kind of more like a leadership ownership role of whatever it is that you're going to be doing um, will, will be helpful. I think um, just think you have to kind of think about what you're interested in as well, of course. So, you know, whether it's a leadership role or not, um, you know, obviously if it's something you've never done before, it might be more of a support role. So I think instead of thinking about um, about it that way, you can also just think about, you know, what type of things maybe have you not been exposed to during your fellowship that you do uh, that you do want to actually get exposed to during your full time role. Um, so, and kind of to the parentheticals there, uh, yeah, multiple team members. I mean, that's always good. You'll get different perspectives. Um, you know, maybe if you were on a product during your fellowship and you want to try a different product or a different phase of development, that's something to be interested in. Or maybe if you are really interested in your current product and you feel like you're getting a great experience staying on that and trying to get more immersed and have um, kind of more in-depth experience on that. So it really depends on what your priorities are and what your interest, where your interests lie and just um, try to kind of be transparent with yourself on what, you, what you're interested in, what you wanna do. Yeah, exactly. I think Rudy mentioned this kind of goes back to our original points on, you know, what are you looking for in a partner company? But, you know, I would take this question as, what have I done and where are those gaps in my experience? And how do I participate in projects that are going to help fill those gaps? Um, and to Christina's point, the ones that align to, you know, where you see yourself in the future and kind of get you to where you want to be experience-wise uh, and ultimately in your role in um, professional development. Um, you know, I think there, there's a lot of different factors, you know, some of them are listed here, you know, doing more project management things, um, taking lead role in projects, but, you know, maybe you focused on things in the U.S., you want to do something more global, maybe you're interested in a different therapeutic area, I think all those different things help build your resume um, and show that you can succeed in different areas. Yeah, I would also add, um, you know, any types of opportunities where it's a project or an initiative or something that provides you more visibility. Um, you know, that was one of the things where, um, you know, as a fellow, you know, you tried your best to become someone that was known and someone that it wasn't just your initial team mem members and your manager knew who you are. It was people outside of your team. It was um, leadership, upper, man upper management, um, you know, those a lot of different types of key players, especially when you, you know, for me, I went from a small company to a big company. Um, and, um, you know, that it's, it's a challenging to have that level of visibility. So if you can always have a push to see like, hey, if there's one special project you can do, and it's not going to happen right when you start, you know, you have to give yourself a little bit of time to get adjusted, settle in, make sure you understand what your role is, get your own projects up and going that fulfills your role. Um, and then, you know, especially if you're at a new company, um, you know, that trust is developed and people can understand, you know, what you offer, what value you provide. And then if there's something 
you know, that comes along and you have a manager or someone who advocates for you to get a special project that provides that level of visibility, then, you know, you talk that through and what it is and, and what needs to be done. Um, but visibility is a big thing. I think, you know, you never stop networking, um, especially when you go to a new company. Um, you want to make sure that not only people know who you are and, and what you want to do, but they, people, but, that, but they experience the work that you have done and they experience that kind of impact. Um, so I think that's a big one. And that's especially something I was looking for um, when I was um, interviewing and, and looking at companies like what level of visibility will I have the chance to do and, and how do I have the opportunity to showcase myself to say the head of oncology, for example, or the head of this, um, you know, if you find those opportunities and that's, that's pretty important. All right, thank you. And uh, now just going to pull up questions from the audience. So uh, whoever wants to answer, feel free to just go ahead and answer. Um, so the first one, what is the benefit over getting a job in industry right out of pharmacy school? So um, obviously, you know, we all, we all did the fellowship, so maybe we can't speak in terms of personal experience, but I think in terms of just general, I guess, awareness of other people's um, experiences. Um, I think uh, the big one is, of course, as a fellow, we all know that probably you know, the pay is not ideal. So obviously that's a big benefit is, um, you know, coming outside of pharmacy school into an entry level role most likely would be a little bit of a higher pay. Um, the flip side to that is that fellowship really trains you to kind of groom you for a role um, that you want after fellowship after those two years. So it's kind of like you kind of bite the bullet for a couple of years and get the experiences you need to be successful post fellowship that way. And um, it's more of like a learning and development experience than a lot of entry level roles would be. Because um, with entry level roles, you kind of are more fulfilling a business need um, than necessarily in the learning and development program for two years where you can have you know, potentially different rotations or um, they want to usually, if it's a good fellowship, want you to have the type of experiences that you need to help you along your career. So um, that's kind of a pretty big difference. Um, I, but I think the entry level roles, you know, it really depends a lot on your manager and your team. You could have a really great learning and development experience in an entry level role. And I know plenty of people who did that instead of fellowship and are perfectly happy and have been able to advance in their career and get the experiences that they want. So I think, you know, getting your foot in the door into industry at all is important if that's what you're interested in. So I think, um, you know, it's, it's fine either way. Just, you know, it's whatever you make of it. All right. Yeah, I think Christina covered it. <laughs> All right. Um, so I guess moving on to the next question then. Um, so it was mentioned that two-year fellowships entail a managerial position. However, what position would you achieve with the one-year fellowship? Yeah. yeah, I think I might have said that. Oh, no, go ahead, Dan. I, I was just going to say, um, I, I think all of us um, did two-year fellowships, but I do know that um, there's still a good amount of one-year fellowships where there's still people that – we get a manager role or associate manager role. Um, I think it just really all depends on um, the the role that you apply to and the hiring manager. And and I think don't don't anchor too much on years of experience. Um, I believe I've definitely have heard that there's some positions out there that have made that kind of exception. It just really just depends on what you offer. I mean, if you really fit certain skill sets and if you can prove that within a one-year fellowship then you can get that level of a job like a two-year fellowship would um you know that's exactly that's at least what i heard i don't know if anyone else heard differently but that's been my experience with other people yeah i agree with that i, I also kind of want to stress that uh i said manager but you know i think it's really company independent um and also you know you could potentially get a manager role with a one-year fellowship i think you know uh, my experience and what I would stress is not to really focus on the job title and the um, manager versus AD or, um, you know, specialist or whatever it might be, but I would really focus on what the position offers you uh, in terms of development and um, I guess selfishly, but, you know, it's something we're ultimately always thinking of really base pay is kind of probably more um, substantial to your, your career um, development than title. Um, something that I didn't really know going into uh, interviews and going full-time is, you know, that base pay kind of determines for your career 
what your base pay is kind of going to be from there. So um, forget about title and really kind of push for that because that's where things are going to build off of in the future. All right. And uh, just combining two of these questions here, um, how focused were you on matching your applications to the therapeutic area where you worked as a fellow and how many rounds of interviews did you generally have um, for your role? Um, yeah, so I would say that I, I really, so I did oncology. I wanted to say in oncology. Um, I mean, I, I, I also looked at immunology. I looked at, um, you know, other types of areas too. Um, I mean, that's, that's really just based on um, your preference. I mean, if you're open to moving others to a therapeutic area, um, you know, that's, that's something that you definitely can do to expand the number of positions you apply to. Um, I also think it's important that you just pay attention to just how the industry, the industry is moving along. Um, so, you know, you, you should really look up like how much investment is being poured into these different types of therapeutic areas, um, you know, for in general, um, you know, there's, there's a lot more of these advanced type of medications coming out, you know, have the rise of biologics and gene therapies and things like that. Um, and, you know, we have these more specialized products in cardiovascular and other types of areas. Um, so these are just things you have to keep in mind. And this is just where a lot of the bigger opportunities tend to lie to and maybe set yourself up for other good roles down the line too. Um, and to answer the second part, um, you know, the number of rounds of interviews, um, it kind of depends. Um, there was one company um, that I only had the phone interview, the phone screen, and then um, I had an onsite interview where I had multiple in a day. Um, and then there was one company I had um, two phone screens, and then there was an onsite, and then there was one more onsite, um, which was a lot. So I, you know, it really just depends on the manager, it depends on the company. Um, but Usually it averages around two to three. Um, you know, I don't, I don't think it should really be more than that. All right. Um, and uh, I guess this is something that everyone's thinking of. At what point should you be worried? Uh, when should you know when, where you'll be after fellowship? Don't ever be worried. <laughs> yes, I, I, I think I saw that question like earlier on, right? It, yeah, I mean, it happens in waves, right? Some people kind of like leave after a year and like cut their fellowship in half and you're like, whoa, should I be doing that? Um, really just focus on yourself, right? Um, that role might not be there at the perfect time, but it's gonna come eventually. And it's not like you have to end your fellowship and be in a full-time role. You know, you could, you know, go back to school in the meantime, you could do X number of things until the right position kind of comes along. I think the real risk would to be to take something that you don't really want and then you're kind of stuck in a position that um, doesn't kind of meet your career development goals. That'd be way worse than, um, you know, something taking a month longer to come along. Okay. And um, I can just take one to two more questions, but uh, this is more about the interview process. Um, can you walk us through the interview process, assuming it's a first round fit phone call and maybe another similar call before a super uh, day? What could you expect to be doing during the super day? Are there any presentations? Um, so I think the person's just interested in knowing whether or not there's like phone screenings, things like that for like job interviews. Yeah, so I, I'll try my best to summarize it the best I can. Um, but I mean, generally what happens is, you know, you get an email from somebody, most likely HR saying, hey, you know, we want to interview for this position. And um, I think it depends on the role. Sometimes I would talk to an HR person first and then they would screen people, then present um, applications and candidates to the hiring manager and then the hiring manager would then make a call. Um, or in my case, um, with the job I have now, I just got connected to say, hey, we want to interview you. And then I actually had the first phone screening with the hiring manager um, himself. Um, and then what would happen is then, um, you know, depending on how fast they want to move, um, you know, they will tell you, um, you know, yes, we want to move you forward. You know, can we bring you on to the next step? And they will tell you, they will tell you what, ne what is needed. Um, I mean, if you have to make a presentation, they'll tell you, well, you need to make a presentation on X, Y, and Z. If, you know, you're just going to come in and they say, hey, you're just going to have a day where it's a half day, it's a full day, um, 
you know, what happens is someone from HR or, or one of the assistants um, from, from the company will give you a schedule um, and basically they have, a, they have time set for you to be in a room and then you are basically just um, having people come in and out and you're being interviewed for 45 minutes to an hour. Um, and then, you know, it, it really just depends. Um, I think the process will vary somewhat company to company, but you know, if, if, if they're bringing you along, um, they'll tell you and be very transparent about what the process is like. Um, or sometimes what happens is that they're a little slow. Um, you know, sometimes you have to understand that, um, you know, some companies have certain positions open and they're not too much of a rush to fill them. Um, and, you know, managers need their time to look through a bunch of candidates or maybe they're just not getting back to you um, for another different reason. So don't stress out too much about the timing and what's really needed. Um, you know, it's important that you still ask those questions. Um, you know, hey, like, what's the next step? Like, you know, what's, do I have to do something where I present to a group or, um, you know, if you want to ask that type of question, that's fine. Um, but they'll, well, they'll tell you what, what it's like as you're going along each step. All right, and just a last question, just going to combine two of them together. Uh, in terms of negotiations, uh, how do you negotiate pay and what's the minimum amount you take when you uh, accept when you're accepted? So like advice on negotiating. I'd say, I mean, post fellowship, you really should be hopefully getting something that's, um, at, you know, you want something most likely at least toward close to or in the triple digits, I would say. So that's probably a good range. It really depends on the company, the role, and um, the title. There's so many different factors involved. So I don't want to kind of give one blanket answer. Um, it might depend on the department. Um, so, so I can, I mean, I can kind of give a range for, for my department. Um, the, a lot of the places I was interviewing with both externally and internally kind of said like 120 to 130, but I also know in other departments, it could be like 90 to 110. It, it really depends. So I don't want to give like one blanket answer. I don't know if anyone else has other experiences or is comfortable commenting on that. Christina, you scared me when you said triple digits. You meant like six, right? <laughs> oh, that's what I meant. Yes, yes, of course. <laughs> you meant uh, even triple thousand. Yeah. Oh gosh. She meant um, she meant triple no, I, digits a day. I, no, just one hundred dollars. <laughs> so I would recommend you know you guys are probably close with other fellows, so you know maybe they have an idea of what they've been offered or heard from other fellows, and you can kind of learn that way. Um, to Christina's point, like, I'd be really surprised if it wasn't in the triple thousands, um, <laughs> that's, triple you know, depending on the roller. <laughs> yeah. Um, but again, um, you know, get a feel for it and kind of weigh that against other factors, right? Is it the work-life balance you want? Is it going to be a crazy commute? Are they going to offer you relocation, stocks, uh, 401k matching, all these other factors come into play. So. I think uh, it's easy to look at base salary, but also think about some of those other factors that are going to come into play. Yeah, I, I would say a helpful tool. Um, I actually invested in LinkedIn Premium, um, and uh, they have a feature where they can actually tell you, like, hey, here's, like, the average um, reported salary um, from hiring managers or from HR from this company on this particular role, and that can give you a sense of it, too. I think Indeed also has a feature like that. You know, you can look online, like, you know, how much as a manager in regulatory affairs may get in, far, in the pharmaceutical company or the biotech company. There's a lot of people that post about it too. So you can, you can probably find it and work with a range. Um, you know, in terms of negotiation, it's, it's, it's definitely tricky and it's a little scary and um, you know, you're not going to do it perfectly all the time and that's fine. Um, but be prepared. I mean, um, especially if you do make an offer. Um, I mean, when I was going for interviews um, and, and I got a couple offers, you know, that, that was a very immediate question that HR would ask you, like, hey, like, what are you, what are you looking for in terms of salary? And then, um, you know, you have to be prepared for that. And um, what happens is then they go back, they talk to the hiring manager, they see what their standards are, and then they make you an offer. And, you know, that's where then the negotiation happens. It's like, you try to see like, hey, like, can I, 
get a little bit more in salary? Can I get a little bit higher bonus? Can I get maybe a starting? You know, you just have to, you know, see and, and make sure that you justify it um, the best you can. Um, and this is something where it helps, you know, to everyone's point, ask for advice, see what, you know, the previous year fellows have done, um, what their experience has been at that particular company, if you know anybody. Um, sometimes each company does it a little bit differently. Um, but definitely do your homework. Um, and then if, you're, if you know, especially if you're very close to potentially getting an offer, if you're at the last stage, make sure you have that in mind uh, because HR will definitely talk, talk to you about that like literally right afterwards. All right, thank you. Uh, apologies for running a little over. Uh, I just wanna go ahead and wrap up this webinar for the evening. I hope it was informational and provided insight in the overall transitioning process. Um, and this webinar is recorded. Uh, you could access it on the IPHO website and there's gonna be a post webinar survey that's, that will be sent out, so make sure to fill it out. Uh, I also wanna thank all the speakers for sharing all of your thoughts and advice this evening and all of you for joining the webinar. Um, all right, so have a great rest of the night. And for the second year fellows, I hope all your interviews go well. Thanks, everybody. Good luck. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Goodbye. Best of luck. Good luck.